It's bread baking day, so in this video, let me show you how I bake bread with 100% freshly milled wheat. Hey everyone, welcome back to Grains and Grit, where we talk about all things real whole grains from a biblical perspective. It's actually been two years since I posted my very first video, which actually was my simple yeast bread loaf recipe using 100% freshly milled wheat. And so I figured it was time for an update. So as I'm baking bread today, I'm gonna be showing you guys how um, I'm doing it these days. Good news, my actual recipe has not changed, but I have tweaked a little bit of the size that I do, things like that. So do know that this printable recipe is still available on my website um, and it will be in the description box below so you can print it out. If you're already familiar with this recipe, then feel free to bake along with me. So let's get started. So of course, first off, we gotta select some wheat berries today. Don't be jealous of my fancy schmancy post-it note labels. Um, so my favorite combination at the moment is actually hard, half hard red wheat, half hard white wheat. However, bottom line is you need a hard wheat berry. You can use all hard red, you can use all hard white, and if you're starting out, start with these two grains. They are the easiest to deal with. So we're gonna grab both of these and get to milling. All right, so we have our wheat, and this is, for anyone who's been along for any length of time, is Miss Betsy Bosch. I love her so much. This is a Bosch Universal Mixer. Another thing to point out about my recipe is people often ask me, um, do you have, you know, one a recipe for one loaf? I don't need as much. Um, and I actually do, and that's in my ingredients quick sheet that you can grab. It's completely free. It's my little cheat sheet that I have. It not only has um, the ingredients for one loaf, two loaf or three loaves, but it also has my most used recipes. So be sure to grab that because that'll be the easiest reference to know if you're only wanting one loaf. Whether again, you're using a mixer, kneading by hand, um, the steps are the same. And do know I have a video all about kneading by hand for you guys, I'll link that below. But with our Bosch Universal Mixer, I do have the dough hook and the little, I think it's called dough hook extender that we have here and our first step is actually very simple we're going to take our freshly milled wheat and we're just going to create basically um not a proof um not a levain i guess it's kind of like a levain but bottom line we're going to put some of our flour in here with all of our yeast all of our water let it sit get it to get that yeast going and activated um, that's really going to help give your bread a boost when it comes to the rising time so for this the total amount of flour that we're going to be needing is anywhere from nine to nine and a half cups of flour that is about six cups of wheat berries that you will be milling um, now this is not an exact science with freshly milled wheat you may find that you need more or less flour depending on the day if it's humid if it's cold, if it's raining, things like um, those type of issues with the weather that can affect your bread. And this is why I do not weigh my ingredients. I just measure them and it works out fine. And you'll see what I mean later on when we're into the kneading section. But for now, no matter what the weather is, we're gonna do, I like to put for this one, three cups of flour. In here, it doesn't have to be exact. If it's a little over, that's totally fine. Three cups of flour, and then we're adding two and a quarter tablespoons of instant yeast. I do prefer instant yeast. Um, you can use active yeast, but if you're using active yeast, this proofing process is a must do. You have to do what I'm doing here to get that yeast activated. Otherwise, with instant yeast, you technically can skip, the, skip this step, but I don't like it. All right, and then we have three and three quarter cups of warm water. And so let's mix this up real quick. And now we're just gonna let it sit for about 10 to 15 minutes. All right, so here we have it after about 15 minutes. So you see that it is a little bit bubbly. You can't really tell on video, but it has actually risen a bit as well and that's what we're looking for so now we just need to add the rest of our ingredients remember we've already put three cups of flour in here um, we've got our yeast and we've got our water now we need to add the rest of our flour that's needed our salt and 
our honey and oil. So this is our half cup oil, half cup of honey. And then we're adding our three and a quarter teaspoon salt. This is Redmond salt, my favorite salt. And now here's where we add our flour. Now, key to this, whether you're kneading by hand or by a mixer, the recipe calls for nine to nine and a half cups of flour. You do not want to just dump in all of that flour. With all purpose flour, you generally can do that. You can't do that with fresh milled wheat because you could end up with too much flour or not enough. So what I like to do is if the recipe calls, in this case for nine to nine and a half cups of flour, I'm gonna now add a total of eight cups of flour in here. Start kneading and mixing it together and we're gonna be going from there. So we already have three in. So this is four, five and eight. And then very important, putting the lid on, trust me. <laughs> And then let's start mixing this up. Just wanna show you guys here. Now in the mixer, or again, by hand, this is crucial. And I think this is where some people um, get either too dense of a bread, you know, not turning out. In our mixer, where I'm going to want an, to add enough flour to where it just starts to pull off the bowl. Um, and this is pretty much the same if you're kneading by hand. Um, but from here, I do not measure my flour. Um, I generally just add a quarter at a time until it is good. And that's what you're looking for. So again, at this point, you don't want to be so obsessed with the measurements. Just starting adding a little bit at a time until it starts getting to that point. And one thing to add is with a mixer and by hand, add a quarter cup at a time and then wait a little bit. Let it get incorporated before just continually adding more in. So I usually wait a good 15, 20 seconds, I don't count, um, just to make sure that it's going in before adding more. All right, that is definitely good where it's starting to pull off the bowl. I don't bother scraping this down because with the kneading process, it's gonna eventually get all of this as well. And now in my Bosch, we need for about nine, for no, well, I set the timer and I need this for nine minutes. If you are kneading by hand, you're gonna need maybe 15 to 20 minutes and you'll start noticing, that, see how right now it looks, um, it's not smooth looking at all. It's gonna easily break apart. We're now looking for it when it looks smooth and when it's ready, we'll go from there for other tips. So I'll see you back here in nine minutes. Hey, so, while the bread is kneading, now is an excellent time to answer a question that I receive and that is, Felicia, where do you get all of your grains? Where's your favorite place to shop for grains? Where can you buy a grain mill, um, the Bosch Universal Mixer, the Anarchskin mix Mixer, all of these things pertaining to milling your grains. So glad you asked because my favorite place to shop is definitely Pleasant Hill Grain. And the reason why is not only are they the cleanest grains that I have ever received, but they literally have everything that we need, especially for those who are wanting to get started and just want to shop at one place without giving business to the big box companies like Amazon and Walmart. Pleasant Hill Grain is a family owned company. Wonderful, wonderful customer service and everything is shipped to your house. And not only do they have a huge selection of pretty much all the grain mills that I recommend, but if you are a prepper, you are missing out if you have not shopped Pleasant Hill Grain because they have so much more to offer than just things dealing with grain. If meat grinders, it's great for those hunters out there. Um, prepper kits, things for the kitchen, so many things, a huge selection of books. So you really need to check them out. And all that you have to do to do that is just go to grainsandgrit.com slash PhD. And thank you very much, Pleasant Hill Grain, for being a sponsor to Grains and Grit. You know we love you. So here we are after nine minutes. It comes up a little bit. One thing I forgot to mention is the kneading speed that I was kneading this at. It was just at the one setting. That's, that's more than enough for what I need. So here we go with our dough. And what you're looking for, and this is something that is so difficult to communicate on camera, is I'm wanting a soft dough. And with my dough, I actually like it to be slightly sticky. And your dough will feel slightly different depending on the wheat that you have been using. But bottom line is that's a good dough. It is pliable, I can work with it. 
um, let's actually get it out of here. On a large surface, it can be a large cutting board. I just like to sprinkle a little bit of the freshly milled flour that I have left over. If you notice the bowl, it's pretty clean and that's a good sign that I added enough flour. It's not too sticky, too doughy, but, and this is actually really good. Sometimes I do, if I'm gonna err on one side, it is going to be to have a bit more of a sticky dough because you can always add flour. You can't take it away. Um, so it is just, if I, especially if I start getting in the middle, you can see it is just slightly sticky where it's sticking to my hands. If you've kneaded it and it's still really, really sticky, no problem. Just add some flour into your hands, rub it, and then start gently working the dough and it's pulling dough from here, flour from here as well, until it gets to where basically you can work with it. Even though it's slightly sticky, I can still work with this dough. I do not wanna to add too much flour because my bread will be too dense. So now we have a big clump of dough and all the possibilities. Again, my original recipe, this is enough to make two two pound loaves, but I'm actually no longer doing that anymore. Um, I actually now make three smaller loaves with these. Now again, um, to be perfect, <laughs> you could weigh the dough balls to get an even amount to make sure your loaves turn out well, which I do, especially if I'm selling the bread and I want it to look prettier. But I have enough experience where I'm just gonna eyeball it. And from this, we're getting three loaves. And these loaves are gonna be a bit over one pound loaves. Um, if I remember right, when I weigh these, they're usually around like one pound, eight, nine, 10 ounces each, roughly. We have our dough now. So let's set it aside and start working one at a time. And this is also an important step the shaping process. If I need to, I add a little bit of flour down to it, and now we shape it. Love these little, these are called a pastry roller, and we're gonna roll it out into a rectangle. This I'm rolling out to about um, like half an inch, three quarter of an inch thick. It doesn't matter really too much, but you do want it rolled out enough that you can work. Okay, folding, one side. You pull out a little bit and you bring it in. And then the other side, stretch it out a little bit, roll it over. And then you start at one end and you pull a little bit, roll. Pull back a little bit, roll. Pull back a little bit, roll. Pull back a little bit and roll. And now you have a weird jelly donut type shape. And now you just kind of smooth this over a bit. Okay, and this just takes a little practice. I find that it helps to have it on a counter where you can kind of pull, pull a bit here. Okay, and you're wanting a nice loaf shape. And I keep working at it, tucking it under where the sides are fairly smooth, fairly. That's not fairly smooth, so I wanna kinda work at it a little bit more. And I definitely want my top to be smooth because if I find that I already have like a rip or something at the top, it's gonna rip um, the bread coming out. Now, not a big deal for my family, still edible, still good, but you know, if I'm selling it, it doesn't look quite as pretty. And that right there looks pretty good. The sides look good, the bottom a little ugly, that's what we want. And then we place it gently into our pan. Now let's do some more. Here we go. Now you just cover it up. This is a beautiful tea towel, huge tea towel, 100% um, cotton, I believe. One of um, my followers gave to me who lives local, Miss Phyllis. Hey. So bottom line is you just want to cover it with something light. Don't do a heavy dish towel that will weigh your bread down. So if you have baby receiving blankets, those are awesome. Or the flour sack, cloth. I like to actually keep it the dough on top of my oven while we preheat the oven to 350 degrees. And this bread with the instant yeast will be risen in about 30, 35 minutes. And I only do one rise. That's why I love this recipe. It is shorter, it is quicker, 
than others, but the results are wonderful. Okay, it has been about 30, 35 minutes and you can see these have risen beautifully. You want it about an inch above the pan. Obviously the middle one rose more. It was a bigger bit of dough, but this looks good. Now just make sure you don't rise it too much because it is going to continue rising in the oven. So now let's get these bad boys in the oven, 350 degrees and bake for 35 minutes. And here we are after 35 minutes. They are looking absolutely beautiful. So we're gonna pull them out and let them rest in the pans for 10 minutes. All right, so it's been about 10 minutes. So we are putting our loaves on cooling racks because if you keep them in the pan, they will get a little moist. So we're gonna carefully dump here. Let's just look at these loaves so you can see they are nice and tall, but not too ginormous. This one's my largest one that you can see. Let me kind of do it here, but they look beautiful. This is one that I actually purposely left a little split on the side um, where it wasn't completely smooth. And you can see this is what happens if it's not completely smooth, but not the end of the world. So now the difficult part where we have to let them cool. Now you don't have to let them cool, but just be aware that if you go ahead and slice into them hot, that it will cause your loaf to deflate a little bit. Um, so I've done it before, push comes a shove, and I, and I needed to do that, and that's fine. I like to cool them on their side, one, because Julia Child said so, and two, <laughs> um, it does keep your bread from kind of decompressing. And cover them up again, and I will be back here when these are completely cool. And now the time has come, they are cooled down, and now time to slice to see what it looks like on the inside. So you can see the outside looks great. Now let's check the inside. And this is my Cutco bread knife. It's a great little bread knife that I found at a flea market. Um, and so it will be easier to slice the next day. But as you can see, it slices very well. And on the inside, it is nice and soft. There are no huge holes or anything. This is not the bread where we want the holes. And now to prove no holes, let's cut in the middle of the bread to see what it looks like. And as you can see, there are no gaping holes in the middle of the loaf as well, which is where usually you will find the big holes. And here's also a slice. I can get it thinner usually the next day, but just to give you an idea of a slice, as always, I hope that this was a helpful recipe for y'all, especially to you newbies. And as always, I will talk to y'all next week. Bye.